Welcome everyone to Unloose the Goose, episode eight. We are going to talk about a really fun pro uh, concept today, and that's gonna be cities, urban areas, land use planning, and how we even got where we are and what we can do about it now. We are joined by a special guest today, CJ Kilmer from the Dangerous History Podcast. If you have not heard it, then you should totally go check it out. It's, uh, it's Professor CJ or is it Prof CJ? Whatever is fine. What is your website, though? Uh, DangerousHistoryPodcast.com will take you right to the homepage okay. or ProfCJ.org, same thing. ProfCJ.org is the one I usually go to. So yep. you can go there and hit play. I highly recommend these podcasts. And I'm looking forward to his perspective as we dive into the city discussion. Now, we've gotten some blowback about encouraging people to get out of urban areas as they are melting down. So let's start with the problem tonight. And the problem, as I see it, is that cities have forced people into unnatural developments, unnatural alliances through some of the policies as they grow. And that's the fundamental foundation, like underlying thing that I see going on there. But I think it also goes against some of our human nature. So let's start out with this question, and that's, what do you see as the flaw in urban living vis-a-vis -vis stability in somebody's life? And I'm going to throw it to you, CJ, first. Okay. Well, I think um, as a history dork, I always bring everything back to history and I always tend to think of things through that lens. And so when I look back at, you know, five or 7,000 years of human history and cities, uh, I think there's definitely been some particular times and situations in which cities were the place to go uh, for, for maximum freedom, you know, in certain places and times and situations. Like if you look back, for example, at medieval Europe, in most ways, most people were better off if they were in the cities there. You tended to have a little bit more, you know, economic freedom and class mobility and all that than if you were some peasant, you know, basically to, to be in the urban areas back in the medieval period, unless you were the lord of the manor or something like that, it was a pretty a pretty raw deal and you were kind of locked in without many options. But um, I think the cities, and, and if you go back certain places like the Greek city states were probably one of the least terrible uh, political entities from a libertarian perspective relative to like empires or modern nation states, they were less oppressive um, unless you were a slave or something, of course. But the cities in modern times, I think there's a, there's a few key things that cause them to become really not great places um, for liberty. And one of them is the, um, the, the kind of the, the rigid restrictions in the forms of zoning and then also in many cities in the forms of rent control, uh, that these things tend to really reduce options and, and capability of people to innovate in cities in terms of like how they live, where they live, how things are laid out, all that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these, at least in the United States, go back to the, the wonderful progressive era, like the time period of the great Woodrow Wilson, whom I'm doing a many part demolition of on my podcast. A lot of these progressive ideas gave us things like, you know, drastically separating where people live from where they work and where they shop, as opposed to having these things more kind of intermingled um, and, and that sort of thing. And then I think another, another thing that makes cities less friendly to liberty than they used to be in some previous times is that um, cities, because cities are now no longer like self-governing little city states and whatever, like they were in ancient Greece or like they often were in the medieval period or like in um, Renaissance Italy or something like that, where you had like, you know, Florence was like a, a little, little city state, you know? Um, cities now are nested inside of big, powerful nation states, you know, national leviathans. And in our, in our country, at least, they're also within states too. And what this often allows the, the big cities to do is to um, socialize some of their costs and problems onto people who don't live in that city and don't even get any of the, the benefits from you know, that money and those resources. So you know, a big city might be nested in a state that's got tons of people that live nowhere near the city, but they're able to dominate the state political system and then squeeze the rest of the state 
to kind of subsidize themselves and bail themselves out when they need it. And the feds can do the same thing at a bigger level. So to me, like those are the the kind of big picture things of what went wrong is sort of like the, the zoning and, and rent controls and other restrictions that reduce spontaneous order and all that sort of stuff. And then the ability of cities to use bigger levels of government like state and national governments to subsidize themselves and bail themselves out so they don't have to pay the price for their own you know, bad economic policies and that sort of thing. That was a great overview. Uh, I would love to hear New Jersey pipe in on this cell. So what, what are your perspectives on the cities? What's I think, the problem? I think he hit the nail on the head. I think nowadays it's, it's a real shit show. I mean, up here, it's like, we're basically still on lock. I mean, it's a hard lockdown still. Um, but I don't know if that was always the case. I think CG brought up a great example about Florence. Back then, you really had a sort of a competition amongst like different systems of government. And not that it was efficient or acceptable by our standards, but compared to what we have today, it certainly was uh, certainly is a, a step in the right direction. At least there is that element of competition, like I said, and like that's really what you hear a lot of ANCAPs talk about when they start to get into like secession and federalism and decentralization. But nowadays, it's, it's a real mess. And again, like CJ said, uh, these cities are, are footing the bill on people who don't even live here. So now, like, look at this coronavirus thing, right? Like, I remember there was here, there was a thing recently, well, no, one's, no one can pay their rent, so uh, the, landlord, the, the landlords can't pay their rent. And someone posed the question to Cuomo, like, all right, well, what now? And he just said, oh, well, you know, the Fed will take care of it. So why should somebody in Nebraska have to pay people's rent here? So, like I said, I think he hit the nail on the head. It's a real shit show now, but it's not always that case. It doesn't have to be that case. Also, like, that's cities are sort of a naturally occurring phenomenon, right? Like that's people conglomerate around ports and areas where trade is sort of uh, centralized. So it's not that we should be hostile to cities. It's more that we should be hostile to cities within states. Well, the, the first cities, if you read um, James C. Scott, like against the grain, the first cities were really in, mo in the modern era last 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 years centered around floodplains where you could grow food and people would, people would gather there to eat, but also for safety and there's safety in numbers. And the, that's two main things that cities no longer have. You're not going to be able to sustain, sustain yourself in a city because unless you're Carl Hess, you can't start a, most people aren't going to start a farm in the city and you can't protect yourself. I mean, look at every, pretty much every major city in the North and in the, in the upper Midwest, you can't even own a gun. So there's no protection. There's no food. You're relying on everybody. You're basically relying on other people for your safety and for your sustenance. And it just doesn't make any sense anymore. I mean, it's it has to get to the point where people go into the cities to work and then leave because and they do that every day because they um, they live somewhere else. They live someplace where it's safer and they can better sustain themselves. But the question is, like, how rural do you want to go? Like, how how what's the ideal size for, for I mean, a I, I'm I'm barely outside of the city good luck finding my neighborhood. I mean, it's like, you know, if these mobs start coming out into the suburbs, they're going to have a tough time even finding my neighborhood. And if they do, we're pretty psycho here. I mean, we're, everyone's armed here. They're going <laughs> to they're, they're gonna be dodging 62 grains like crazy. So, um, I mean, but in other places like New York, I mean, you really have to think about where you're, if you're going to get out, I mean, going over to Jersey, ugh, you know, but going upstate, I mean, you're going to, you may have to go past Westchester County. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny when you think about the lesson you could have learned during nine 11 in New York, right? How many people got stuck? It, that was rough. Yeah. Oh, we got one raising the hand on, on the show today, John or Jack, any other thoughts on, on the problem at this point? So to me, part of this has to do with a, a, a different question, I guess. In, in our modern society, why, why is every large city dramatically democratic to the level of social, socialist liberalism? 
So, so to me, there, there, if you can identify that problem, we can actually identify what went wrong. Because name a major city in America today, a major city in America today that's run by Republicans. And, and I'm not a big believer in a dichotomy, but I said in a video I put out today that what voting does is show you who the people are that occupy the space that you've decided to move to in, in, in the modern world. I can't think of a city with more than a couple hundred thousand people in it today. Uh, with the, I mean, one of the few would be Fort Worth. Fort Worth is a Republican-led city. And if you and if you look at the difference between when the demonstrations happened in Fort Worth over uh, George Floyd compared to Dallas, they were night and day. Fort Worth was the model of what they call peaceful protesting. They did their march up and down the street, and they went to the Capitol, and they chanted, and they picked up their garbage. There wasn't a window broken. In Dallas, they had the same fires and problems that they have everywhere else. It wasn't as bad, but it was really bad. So what makes it that way? Why do we have so much of a mindset of, I want to be taken care of? And I think everybody hit on it maybe without realizing it. What the cities have always represented was safety and protection and opportunity provided to you from resources that came from somewhere else. So people with a predisposition to, I want to live in a place where I can have all the good stuff and do less of the work. The person that, you know, gets on the tandem bicycle and puts their feet up on the handlebars is not the only person in these cities, but they're predisposed by and large to move to them. So I think to me, that's a big part of it. I think it has to do with size. So the late Toby Hemingway in his, his book, uh, Permaculture, Liberation Permaculture, Permaculture City, I remember which one he, what he called it. Um, but he said that the average person can know about 200 people and actually know them in their community. And much beyond that, you really stop knowing people. So, the, you know, maybe you could have 10, 20 fold that. And then you have all these little groups. Like I remember when Philly was not a bad city to live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but it was because every neighborhood was its own tight knit community. And so it wasn't really Philadelphia. It was a hundred little communities. Once you get to a size where that stops being the case, because anybody's ever been like in downtown Manhattan or whatever, you walk through that street. You don't, you wouldn't be able to pick one person out the next day. You couldn't, you could say, who'd you walk past? I don't know. So we end up, the, when we get a certain size, we end up, everybody becomes an NPC. It's dehumanizing. We stop identifying individuals anymore. And once we do that, we simply want, our own needs taken care of. And I think that's where everything goes wrong with these giant cities. That's just my opinion, but that's, that's the context I see it in. I've lived in a number of cities and I have to say my favorite one was Houston. The one everybody denigrates as the worst city in the entire country. And it was because every neighborhood was kind of its own thing. It was the most bike friendly city I'd ever been in. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, just for context there. So they're supposed to be bike friendly, but it, you're, you're always battling with the government transportation. Uh, X or John, anything to add? Yeah, I think cities, I appreciate visiting large cities on a short-term basis. I live in Austin, Texas, which is a pretty large city, but it's not like Houston or New York City. And so when I go to a large city, I visit New York City quite often and Houston's right down the road. Um, I appreciate the culture the kind of melting pot aspect of it. I appreciate the commerce, which I think is a big benefit. And with the culture, I appreciate the arts. And there's just so much stuff to do and so much stuff to experience. That being said, I personally wouldn't want to live in a large city for a significant amount of time. Uh, in large part, the very thing that makes cities special, which is a whole lot of people being in a small area, bringing all sorts of different thoughts and cultures and backgrounds uh, that same thing that makes it special also is a big problem and you know a lot of human beings are are pretty messed up and have a lot of problems and there's a lot of trauma that's taken place on an individual level on a mass level and I think when you bring that many messed up people together and they have a messed up social organization that that uh, mends them together which is government I think it's a recipe for disaster and the issues that human beings have when they're relating to each other are amplified whenever there's just so many more of them. So I prefer like the mid city, I prefer to be on the outskirts of a city 
I'm like 20 minutes away from downtown Austin right now, but we're in the process, as I mentioned on a previous show, of buying a plot of land, at least 45 minutes or, or around there away. So to still be able to benefit from the business, the commerce, the excitement, the amenities, but to be able to get the heck out of Dodge and have some peace and quiet, I think is a nice, a nice balance. And then, you know, mid-sized cities, we were thinking about anchoring our property as a city where we go to for, for commerce and for groceries and stuff uh, to Austin. But Austin has really, with the Democrat socialist run city has really been going down the, uh, down the poop chute and the homelessness thing is just absolutely nuts. It's turning into a San Francisco scenario. I'm compassionate for homeless folks, but when they uh, decriminalize camping, which is a libertarian question that we could debate about on another show maybe, but when they did that, it really exploded and all the homeless folks in the South, I guess, were like, hey, Austin's really friendly to homeless people. Now it's bad news bears. So we're actually shifting our decision maybe to anchor to San Marcos, which has like 63,000 people and a beautiful river running through it. And that kind of size, I think, is more manageable. You can know more people. You can be more involved in the community. You can still have some of the benefits of a big city without all of the craziness. So do you all see this as a uniquely American problem? Well, the thing, I don't like people. I like individuals. But as a whole, <laughs> humans can be very difficult to 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 negotiate with. We're seeing that in the mob rule that's going on right now in places like Portland and Kenosha. And we're saying like, okay, we wanna be outside of a city, but what's the right distance? So for me, minimum 30 miles or a half an hour drive because that's about one day's hike, right? So if cities are the congregation point, let's say we have a, a, a large scale disaster or something and people will be looking in cities for, you know, how to rebuild or whatever. And that's, that's a day's hike. Um, so you can go get supplies or whatever and then be back at your homestead, let's say. Um, it, it's like Jack said, you know, everybody goes to the cities who want an ease of life or easy access to all of the amenities that, that society provides, let's say. Entertainment, um, you know, diverse food, diverse culture, diverse ideas, uh, art, all of that wonderful stuff that helps us define civilization. But when you get that many people in an area together, the 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 manner in which we relate with one another is is fucked up at the at the most basic level and that many people together in an area with just the basic lack of oxygen right there are lack of trees and so people are not getting the right nutrients just at, at the most basic fundamental level um and very much likely not getting the right nutrients in their food either so you're you're talking about uh, a population that is functioning at a lesser quality than most others in, in rural areas would, who are getting high nutritionally dense food, access to oxygen at a higher degree without the pollution and, and toxicants. And, you know, it, it, I can't, I, there is no city that I am comfortable in for more than like a visit, you know? Um, Paris, I would have to say is one of my favorite, even though it's a shithole in so many own, of its own ways. Um, so yeah, I think 30 minute, 30 minute drive, what, what was that, John? Sorry, I'm just saying a literal shithole, Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just happened to like their bakeries, and you know that was that was it. So <laughs> well, that's like that. That's like New York City. I mean, when I go to New York City, it's like Little Italy, Little Koreatown. Sal, yeah. what do we do? We go yeah, to yeah. Chinatown. Right to we go to Chinatown when we get it. When I go there, <laughs> right now you're in Wu Flu. I don't. I don't. There I don't are care. more dangerous predators in a city than any national park in any part of the world, especially Washington D.C yeah exactly <laughs> so i'm always like on alert in a city and it's just hyper like uh sensations and and yeah like I, I... I got a question for uh for cj you brought up something that i thought was pretty interesting about like the whole you tied it into like the progressive era and how they tried to like separate people from the places they work can you like just explain that a little bit yeah well that's where you start to get um a lot of different movements that sort of coalesce because progressivism you know, to differentiate it from populism, some of you, you may be familiar with populism and William Jennings Bryan and all that. Populism, one of the differences between them was that populism tended to come from the more rural areas and progressivism was very much an urban thing. It was a, it was originally a Northeast and kind of Great Lakes states, big city thing. And so a lot of progressivism before it latched onto the federal government started with state and local. And a lot of it dealt with like urban reform and urban renewal and that sort of thing. And these are the sorts of things that often sound nice when you don't really think through what they really mean and what some of their 
um, you know, unintended consequences are going to mean. So, you know, things like slum clearance and urban renewal and, you know, some things that may even be good as far as like putting up some nice parks and some, some libraries or whatever like that, you know, with Andrew Carnegie's donation or something. Um, but, but then you also get this, um, you get more and more municipal socialism where, where city and, and local governments like take over the streetcar system you know, that maybe was built and run by a private company previously, or they take over the electrical system or the phone system. You know, they're, they're always, they're always big on uh, transportation and communication infrastructure, right? Wanting to take that over. Um, and, you know, in some cases that might seem to make sense, especially back then, it, you can make some sort of natural monopoly argument, but you still run into all the problems you always run into with any kind of, any kind of monopoly. Um, that it becomes bureaucratic and top heavy and inefficient and over time costs go up and quality goes down. Um, and then you also get the zoning where it's about physically um, restricting what you can do in different locations, whether you own property or not. You know, it's no longer about uh, just doing what you want with your property as long as you're not directly harming someone else or their property. Instead, it's like, oh, this, this whole area here is going to be nothing but residences. You know, and um, to to go to a store, you gotta go some great distance and and drive or ride the subway or whatever it is, and um, you know, generally the the newer a city is, the more of that it has in place, right? Cities that popped up or or grew m the most after World War II tend to be the most sprawling and the most kind of segregated that way. Some of the older cities less so. There still is some mingling of like where people live and where they work and where the stores are and whatever. Oh. Um, but a lot of that comes out of the progressives and a lot of it was, you know, these sort of ideals that like you want your neighborhood to just be nothing but nice, you know, middle class houses of nice, you know, wasp progressives and perfect lawns and all like that. And we can't have that be blighted with like saloons and shops and who knows what and, you know, dirty immigrant peddlers on the street and whatever like that. Um, and so it appeals to a certain type of person, right? It appeals to kind of like an upper middle class and higher busy body kind of a person, right? The, the gentrified. You know, yeah. 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 There, there's an element of that for sure. Um, so anyway, that, that's where a lot of that comes out of the, that sort of, you know, type of progressivism in the big cities that you, you associate with people like Teddy Roosevelt, you know, when he was early in his career before he decided to take over the world. Well, but also yeah. you could get you could get uh, access to goods and services in a city that you couldn't necessarily get in the rural areas. Um, you know, higher fashion, all of these these things that are social like kind of things. But now with the internet, you can get anything you need, no matter where you are in the for the most part, at least in the United States, right? It's what does everybody think the right the postal service, right? <laughs> what what is say, the I go ahead, Nicole? Not Scott, you go. Um, what would everybody say the ideal size of is like the upper limit? If we look at like when I heard Kenosha was basically burning, I was like, really? Because I'd been to Kenosha, but back in like 1998 or 1999. And it seemed very kind of small town rural in a lot of ways, you know, similar to uh, the town I grew up in Pennsylvania, like Pottsville, which is like a 30,000 person city. Well, I looked it up. Kenosha's got a hundred thousand people in it. That's that's significant in size. It's also kind of smack between Minneapolis and Chicago, about an hour out of Chicago, forty-five minutes out of Minneapolis, and it's kind of urban sprawl now, all the way in between both of those cities in Kenosha. And so, when I realized that's what it had become over the last 35, 40 years, I wasn't so surprised anymore that that it it kind of had that impact. To me, you know, if you're looking at a city with ten to thirty thousand people in it, that's that should be enough to have any resource or any kind of cultural gathering that you could ever really want to have. Especially uh, as Xavier was saying, in a time where we can have almost anything you want delivered to you within forty-eight hours. And, and when you get much bigger than that, like how how can you really maintain kind of those clustered? old neighborhood feel anymore is what it seems like to me well that's why i was bringing up the question about is this a uniquely american thing because i would be happy in munich germany but if you think about how that city 
is built, it is a series of smaller neighborhood like areas. And there is a lot more stability there because there's a lot more local food production just in the culture. Right. So that was my, my, my question is, is this progressive policies that have led to what we have today? And now the big thing is, you know, mixed use developments where you have the stores on the street level and the people upstairs and we somehow all get to walk to work because our job magically changes to close to where we live. And then if we change jobs, we're magically able to get a job close to where we live and don't have to move. Um, I, I, while there has been a lot of regulatory push in Europe, the, the cities I've seen there are less, you know, I will Frankfurt's would be hard, but they're less unstable, I guess, from a dependence on outside inputs. Do you think maybe a lot of their stability has to do with the fact that they are so socially homogenous though? Right? Like, you know, they do have a lot of, you know, people coming and visiting from other parts of the world and all, mm -hmm. but the, the primary residency of any of these European cities, like you're talking about, are going to be, you know, mostly white waspy German people. That's who they're going to be. And they're pretty, mm -hmm. They're a pretty well organized. I don't know what the word I'm uptight, <laughs> like, you know, type of culture. Cause I could say it's not uniquely American. I mean, I served in Panama in the, in the nineties and there's parts of Panama city that you would feel much more safe walking through downtown Portland in a Trump shirt right now than that area of Panama city back then. And it's probably worse there today. So, I mean, there's dangerous parts. There's it's better today. <laughs> Panama city. Yeah, the Americans are moving where you go, right? Americans like, are moving to Panama like crazy. But it depends on where you go, right? There's still some neighborhoods there I could show you that Well, that's everywhere. Right. That you really and when I say neighborhoods, I mean big enough to be its own city that you really don't want to go to, especially if you're obviously American, that there's still a grudge held because, well, you know, we launched an air war on a country that didn't have an air force. And so yeah, yeah. there's some bad blood. But Panama is a great place to be in the countryside back then, and it, it probably still is today. If I if I were to go to P Panama right now, I'd move to Cerro Azul. I mean, it's beautiful mountains, and I would rather be there than Panama City. I promise you that. I think you hit on something, uh, an important factor, Jack, in uh, community cohesion and the absence of, of conflict. And, of course, here in the United States, it's a quote-unquote melting pot, right? And there's people that came from all over – originally Western Europe, there's a lot of Italy and a lot of China, and it's just a whole big mess, right? And that can create conflict because there isn't that cohesion, that uh, identity, so to speak, where everyone can relate to one another and there's a similar history. And so when you were saying that about the homogenous aspect, I was thinking about Chiron, Mexico, which mm -hmm. is Michoacan, which is one of the most violent states overrun by cartel groups. And we had the honor to visit the city and stay there and meet with the elders there. They overthrew their municipal police department. They ran out the mayor. They did away with politics, state and federal. And they did it because the cartel was working with municipal police and they were deforesting, all sorts of stuff. But it got me thinking, because when we're down there, it's super hopeful. They literally have pretty damn close to a free society, right? They have this indigenous form of government, but everybody's okay with it and it works for them. And people are like, well, that'll never happen here in the US. And I try to remain optimistic, but, but one of the elements that made things so effective and work for them as far as freedom goes is that it's an indigenous community, not just the past hundred years, but thousands of years going back to the same family bloodlines resisting against the Aztecs, you know? And so we don't have that here in America. There's not a unified, people can pay homage to this like American exceptionalism, independence kind of deal, freedom, right? But we, a lot of us know that that's total baloney. So I think absent that homogeny, it does make it more difficult for people uh, to get along and especially for people to put up some large scale resistance to, to state tyranny. So when I was growing up, we had a really diverse cultural background of people that lived in, in the small city I grew up in grew up called Pottsville. And I mean, it was Ukrainian, it was Lithuanian, it was Georginian, it was uh, Irish, Italian, like it was all mixed up. And there were, you'd hear conversations in a bar like, shut up, Wop. what do you know, you stupid Irishman? Don't give me no shit, you're a Yuki, you don't know crap. And I mean, like, but 
no one was serious about it. Like it was still like we were all from the coal region. We were all the kids in, in, of coal miners. And it, it, it doesn't seem like it's that way anymore. Instead of having like that melting pot, even though there was that um, kind of that pride in where your family was from or what have you, it was a melting pot. Like in the end, we were all in it together. And today it seems like it's more like instead of a melting pot, it's like vulcanizing, right? So back in the 80s, they had this thing called Robert's Recaps where they would vulcanize a, a new cap onto a tire and it didn't work. It always ended up falling apart and blowing up and killing people. So we don't have that anymore. Vulcanization doesn't work. Melting works. And, and it seems like we've lost that. And then what we did is we, instead of trying to get rid of that, we expanded it so that now we're tribalizing into tribes that are just completely fabricated tribes at least my family really is from the ukraine so when somebody called me a stupid yuki they're playing around or whatever but at least i was a ukrainian like that was the thing like people are identifying now based on a political affiliation or some sort of of a tribalism based on an ideology like black lives matter or something like that and that's creating even more tension less homogenization and I, maybe homogenization is not the right word because that sounds like you're trying to like purify people and that I, I don't want diversity to go away, but I want diversity to be integrated with each other. You know, I, I just think of the difference, like my, my father-in-law came to the United States after World War II, uh, served in the, the Dutch underground and then later in the Dutch Marine Corps. And the only thing he wanted was to come to America. And the day he got here, he knew three words and from that point forward, he did everything he could to be able to speak completely fluent English. And he wouldn't even speak Dutch anymore. So by the time he passed away, he couldn't remember how to speak most of the language he grew up learning. And there was that kind of a unifying trait that even when we didn't get along with each other, this was a place that we were all part of. And I just feel like it's not there anymore. And that makes cities a powder keg. Like, if you want to fix the cities, you have to at least have everybody want to be with each other before you put them all together. You can put 10 kids in a room and then have a good time, but if you put 10 kids in a room that hate each other, you're going to have a bloodbath. Let's let CJ I, make this point. I, I, I want to drop something in here that um, I think a lot of times libertarians don't like to talk about because they're worried that it's going to lead them down certain roads they don't want to go down, but I don't think it has to. And that's class, social class, socioeconomic class, Okay. Libertarians often are very uncomfortable acting like that even exists or is a real thing because they worry that if you acknowledge that socioeconomic class exists and matters, then you have to end up somehow being a Marxist or something. Um, but I don't think you do. And, um, you know, I think we can point out class and that class can create real tensions and problems if it's too extreme. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to call for having the state level everybody. But that, in fact, a lot of the worst extremes of class, as I'm sure you all know, come from the state through its subsidies and political entrepreneurship and all those sorts of things. But when, when I think about the cities I've been to in Europe, and I haven't been to a ton of cities in Europe, but I've been to enough to kind of have a feel for, for a few of you know, the capitals and whatever, um, the cities in Europe that I always enjoyed the most and felt the most you know, safe and comfortable and welcome and all that, not only are they relatively smaller for a big city, you know, maybe a couple million people instead of 10 million, and often fairly homogenous culturally, but they're also tend to be the ones that don't have the most extreme uh, uh, socioeconomic gaps in them. So for example, um, I enjoyed Stockholm, Sweden, and Dublin, Ireland, much more than a, than a huge place like London or, or Paris or whatever. And one of the things is those are relatively more middle-class societies with not as huge of extremes between rich and poor. Yeah, there's some relatively poorer people and richer people in those cities, but it's not, it's not like what you would see in London, let alone in Mexico City or LA or whatever. And so, you know, I think there's a reason that banana republics typically have the most extreme gaps between the tiny elite and the impoverished masses. And so to me, I think one factor that you got to consider in is a given city a good place to be or not, is it, are there these extreme gaps of socioeconomic status? Because I think if there are, it's much more of a powder keg 
and it's much more of a, of a potential, you know, hot box to explode a place like LA or something like that, where you have huge wealthy people just down the road from giant homeless camps like that's um, I, I was just looking up numbers a minute ago and the city that I live on the edge of here in North Florida, it's a mid-sized town and it's about an hour and a half to the nearest big city. And I think that's, that's a good place to be. And the population of the city that I'm kind of on the, on the edge of is about the same as Kenosha, Wisconsin. But there's some important differences. One is we're not surrounded by other cities right up against us and other towns right up against us. We're, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a gap to the next towns, right? And then there's, like I said, about an hour and a half to the next big cities. But another difference is this town I live in, it's mostly very middle class. There's a, there's a few poor areas, but not much. And there's a few semi ritzy areas, but it's not like, you know, Coke, Coke Kingpin mansions or whatever, right? Um, it's mostly very, middle-class bell curve kind of a thing. And, you know, we also had some uh, Black Lives Matter protests, you know, way back, not long after George Floyd happened. And they were orderly. They didn't block traffic. Nobody broke anything or hurt anybody. People marched and said their slogans and, and did their signs and went home. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't particularly uh, bothered or, or felt, you know, worried that, that it was going to get out of hand. And, and again, I think part of it is, you know, again, I'm not calling for the state to make everybody middle class, but simply like, could we create the conditions in which there's naturally going to be more of a normal, you know, bell curve distribution uh, with, with fewer like extremely poor people and extremely super wealthy people. Well, you know, I'm, extent, I'm not against people being wealthy and successful either, but <laughs> you know, when you have these gigantic gaps, it makes for a very volatile powder keg. It makes for distrust. It makes it very hard for people living in the same location to feel like they're, they're part of a real community. Well, so to what extent do you think the cities where those big disparities are have been created through the very the growth and zoning policies that the city is based yeah. on because i know when I, I i was in portland oregon for growing up most most of my life and you know portland oregon was like where i am in tennessee if i was to be at the near city here 20 years ago or 30 years ago now that's how portland oregon was it was a great city we had some problems but as they integrated their transit strategy and their land and their smart growth policies, the, the disparities got bigger and bigger and bigger. And you had to have more and more money to even live in the city limits, which then led to, you know, that typical situation where a lot of people are in one house together and then people can't afford that. So they start camping outside and then we have the tent, tent cities. Yeah. The, a lot of that is by design. Uh, I grew up in New York City. I grew up in the Bronx. And there's a gentleman in the early 1900s, progressive era, named Robert Moses. And he basically laid out the roads for New York City. And I was doing a show with a friend of mine, and we were talking about Queens. And he's talking about how you get to the end of a bus line, and you're in like a lower income area. But if you walk 10 minutes, now you're in a higher income area and it's designed that way. It's designed so that the public transportation can't get to that higher income area. And uh, I spoke to another person who said Denver is, was actually designed the same way. So um, yeah, that's a lot of that is by design and it is breaking people up and saying, okay, this is gonna be a poor neighborhood. This is gonna be, this is gonna be a more uppity neighborhood. So Here in Austin, the comprehensive planning and the zoning that's taken place, it has had a huge impact on the way the city is now. Like in the 20s, they segregated the city. So we have IH35, which goes all the way up near Jack and maybe some of the rest of you goes all the way north into the country. On the east side of 35, they sent all of the African-American and Latino folk. And that was in the 20s. Then in the 60s and 70s, they did their next big city zoning and they sent all of the industrial zoning to the area in the low income minority neighborhoods. Now they're doing it with Agenda 21, which I'd love for us to touch on today. They're utilizing Agenda 21 and their smart growth policies to invest 
not where there's market demand, but in these same poor neighborhoods to try to spice them up and do smart growth and new developments. Uh, and in reality, what's that do? What that is doing is creating more gentrification. So now the folks that had lived in these neighborhoods for generations, they're having to live outside of the Austin city limits in Maynard and other towns that are at Pflugerville and Round Rock. And so there is this big disparity and the ironic thing is the government comes in and says that they have all these policies that are going to level the playing field and redistribute the wealth and, and help the poor folks, when in reality, it's the government intervention that exacerbated the problem in the first place to, to a point where there is going to be wealthy people and there's going to be people that aren't driven to succeed or don't want to make a bunch of money. They just want to get by. Um, that's a natural phenomenon, but I think government intervention and markets have, have made that even worse. And government intervention in cities has created more of a segregation that still lasts to this day. But well, why? Central, central planning is always going to produce crazy imbalances and distortions and mismatches of supply and demand and all these sorts of things, right? So, you know, we should expect the same thing that caused the Soviet Union's economy to so to be so ridiculously, you know, imbalanced and out of whack, if you apply the same the same idea of top down central planning to, you know, planning a city, that in a, in a similar way you're going to get all these weird, out of whack uh, things that you know probably wouldn't be anywhere near as out of whack if there was more market forces um, being able to operate. Are, are we back to a size issue though? Because I, I mean, I'd never really thought about this before till till CJ was just talking about the the social stratification and the disparity. But like where I grew up was pretty small place, about twenty thousand people. That that means there's only going to be so many kids. So like there were only a handful of wealthy families in the whole area, and you know I was dirt poor kid of a coal miner. And, 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 and hanging out with the Yingling family of, of Yingling beer that everybody knows of today. Back then it was only in a state, but they were still very wealthy. Well, I remember being a kid and all of my friends and, and I, we didn't really understand when we would watch TV or something and they would have these kind of clickish high school shows where the rich kids were over here and the poor kids were over here. And the reason was simply that it say all the rich kids decided they were going to have their own little click in Pottsville, they would have been, pretty damn lonely yeah it'd be like there two. just wasn't that many of them so we had this natural mixing of of there was definitely a social class if you based it on income but the people interacted with each other with it wasn't like oh you're the rich kids or oh you're the poor kids or oh you're the middle class like we just were kids and we just all hung out and i think if you when you grow up with people that you have decent relationships you tend to have decent relationships with them as adults so we never kind of looked at it like us and them like we just all hung out together and there was no real none of, you see what i'm talking about that tension between the haves and the haves not it wasn't there it right. was it was very community oriented across all the income levels because if you're the only rich person you got to hang out to poor people or you're alone so once we get to a certain size do we allow that stratification to become more possible do you I think, think it's also the land use planning like the smart growth urban growth boundary pushes people in so then every little piece of space the price of being in that space goes up and that means you have to have more money to even be able to afford a one bedroom or a studio apartment and so there's been some questions on youtube about why are cities or why do some cities have a bigger disparity I think a big part of that, it's not the only part of it, but a big part of that or the way it happened in the places where I've seen smart growth, which are all on the West Coast, is, is that's the core foundation of it. And then they, they make transportation really expensive, except for if you're on the government transportation, and then that only goes where they want you to go, right? Do you look along the, the train lines in Portland and the crime rate, rate within a mile of that's higher because people can finally afford their ticket right they can get on there and commit crimes and get back on the getaway train and it's it's all by design and i think it's by i mean i'm i'm the conspiracy theorist tonight but i think it's by design to keep the poor people poor 
and to keep them out of the not the only conspiracy area. theorist. John's over there going, me, me, and yeah, I. Yeah. Agenda 21, Agenda 21. That's Same what John's here. saying. What do you yeah. think about gerrymandering and what it has to do? Like, do you think that there is a concerted effort to keep con get con get con congressional districts in certain populations so that they can have their, make, maintain their seats, right? Yeah, that's a big part of it. And in and, and, and Atlanta, redlining i mean there are books have been written about the redlining here how you know the we have the second worst traffic in the united states from what i understand um la orange county being the only other one and it's because we don't we there is public transportation but it doesn't go to the suburbs and it doesn't go to the suburbs for a reason and they will they, up until about 15 years ago, they were very open about the reason why it did not go to the suburbs. Now it's whispered, but it was very loud when I first moved here. What's the reason? They don't want black people moving to the suburbs. That's that's flat out what it was. At least though, I would say one school. thing with Atlanta is yeah. you, could, you could get on the train at the airport and get to mm -hmm. downtown and at least that made sense right it goes right to my house that, that's like, how i go to the air there's the only time i ever take public transportation in atlanta is going to the airport because it goes directly into the airport so they spent gazillions of dollars on trains in the dallas fort worth area you can't go from dallas to fort worth or from either city to the airport on the train we have one of the biggest airports in the world if you wanted to build a mass transit system that made sense You'd connect your two giant cities and you'd have a triangle that goes up to your airport and you'd build from there. And no one uses it. It's actually, you can actually use it for free and no one uses it because you're supposed to pay, but nobody makes sure that you do. And still nobody uses it because it doesn't go from where people are to where people need to be. And I don't think it's the same reason that they had it in Atlanta, Pete, but it's, it, it also doesn't make, and it's again, could that happen without government? Would any private entity ever build a train that went from a place where no one goes to where no one wants to be like yeah. that can only happen with government. But I mean, when we, we, we try to come up with solutions, my, my only solution to these city problems is don't be part of it. I hate to be that way, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I'll go ahead and throw out, I'll go ahead and throw out a number. Um, I, I think for someone who's looking to have like some of the nice, you know, stuff and places to go and stores and whatever, but who doesn't want to be completely smothered and uh, miserable and whatever, and who has any sort of like a libertarian streak in them psychologically, I'll throw out, I, I think the, the upper, the upper number should be about 50,000 okay. and there should be some gaps to the nearest town and a bit bigger of gaps to the nearest big cities. And, and the reason I throw out 50,000 um, is basically, again, a history thing. If you look at the, the cities in history that seem to really have been thriving and bustling and dynamic, vibrant places and relatively free places relative to, you know, whatever else was around them at the time, usually they top out, they usually run between about 15 or 20,000 and 50,000, right? And I'm talking about, you know, most of the Renaissance Italian city-states, most of the free medieval cities, uh, the Greek right? Uh, polises, poli, or whatever the, the plural is there. Um, and even look at, look at some of the cities of like the era of American independence, right? Like Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, you know, those were all between like 10 or 15,000 on the low end up to at most maybe 40,000 on the high end. And so it seems to me like somewhere around 50,000, when you get over that, is where it starts to go off the rails. And part of it's the, you know, the depersonalization and diffusion of responsibility, the loss of, of kind of cohesion of real community. And part of it too, and I think this is especially true uh, post-industrial age and perhaps especially post-automobile, is that once you get above 50,000, your stress levels just operating and going to and from work go off the charts. Let's mm. be honest. If you've got a fight with giant traffic every day in a major urban area, that's just going to put you in a rotten psychological state day in and day out. It's going to reduce your patience. It's going to reduce like, so, so when you see another person on the street, you're less likely to smile and nod or say good morning or whatever. You're just going to be in a pissy mood as your default happiness thermostat level. <laughs> and if everybody's walking around, and this is why I hate the entire region from D.C. 
to Boston. That entire contiguous megalopolis, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And I think a big part of it is most of the people walking around in that crazy uh, corridor, I think they're just kind of pissed off and miserable and stressed as their default setting. So of course they're not going to be friendly. Of course they're not going to have patience. Of course they're going to lose their shit if you, you know, accidentally bump them a little bit or whatever it is, you know, on the, on the sidewalk. Of course they're going to flip out about everything. And, you know, of course, because if you jam that many rats uh, in, into, the, into the maze, of course they're going to start to lose it and not act like regular, good, normal, relaxed rats. Dude, anybody here who's married knows that if you stick two humans in a box for a long enough period of time, they are going to fight. If you stick 10 million people in, a, in an area that's really tight, they're gonna fight, right? And they don't have access fights. to oxygen. I'm sorry, Sal, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's Sal's turn, but um, I wanna take a quick pause before I hand it to you, Sal, and do what we usually do at the beginning of the episode. What's everybody drinking tonight? What do you got, oh. Jack? Uh, I was being good and going non-alcoholic and I was drinking sparkling water, but then my wife brought me the, the 2020 equivalent to a uh, to a scene for a white claw. We love Zima. Dorothy. Wow. I'm John? drinking Kratom. 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 Yep. Boy, I Stay wish I had me it. some of that today. Yeah, coffee. Okay, I just had got? Me some Kratom. Coffee. Who has coffee? Pete. Pete. Is it Holler Roast? <laughs> Don't ask me that every week, please. <laughs> <laughs> CJ, what do you got? I'm super not Folgers. I'm Sorry. super Ned Flanders square and boring. If it was the weekend, I'd be sipping some Irish whiskey, but um, it's a it's a weeknight, so just good old fashioned pure water, run through a Berkey. Uh, Berkey water is good. Yeah, do little right water. I had kratom, but now I'm having some Patron. All right, <laughs> kratom and Patron. This is really hard to come by. It's Rapture of the Deep. It's a, a dark molasses moonshine. Where oh, is nice. it? Out of, out of Canada. No, Canadian Scotia. rum. It's really good. It was That's cool. It's, it's fantastic. So um, I wasn't going to drink tonight either. And then Kickstarter really pissed me off. And I decided I would be a, a good alcoholic and have a little, a little <laughs> nip of something. OK, Sal, it's all you. I was just going to say that um, I, I'm going to use a different metric, right? So Wally Conger has this little book called Agoras Class Theory that uh, Pete's done an uh, episode of his show on. I've done an episode of my show on it. And basically, the, the idea is that there isn't a lower class, a middle class, an upper class, or a working poor, any of that nonsense. There's only two classes. There's the plundered class and the, the class of plunderers. And I think that the places where you have a stronger state, you have more, that, that becomes more stratified, right? That becomes more extreme. So like, you know, a place like New York City is going to have a, a bigger uh, class dilemma than a place like, uh, I don't know, like a smaller city, like say like, you know, St. Petersburg, Florida or something like that. Uh, the other thing too, um, you know, you talked about like people being mad and stuff like that. Again, it all goes back to the state, right? Like if you have to wait in traffic, it's because the state monopolizes the roads and they've created this shortage in the transportation industry. So everybody has to wait four hours to get to work. Or if you get, you know, you have to see like homeless people on the subway or something, that's because of the state. It's not because of the individual, it's because of the politicians. So it's important just to maintain focus on who the enemy is, right? It's not your neighbor. It's, it's the political class, the, 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 the parasitical class. Heck yeah. That's a great distinction. The productive and the parasitical. I think that's what Rothbard, the term knowledge that he used. But yeah, and then whenever you have big unions and people that are benefiting immensely from the state, I think that's one of the things that happens in largely democratic cities. And then everyone wants to gear up and vote more and the gerrymander the districts to continue right. to grow in the power. And then the productive class end up going galt, you know, and getting the heck out of California and New York, which we see. Look at in what, Portland. Look They're at what, for example, like um, the, the, the taxi unions have done in California recently, right? Like. That just goes to show you how bloated the, the political class has become that it even includes taxi drivers now because oh, they've yeah. cartelized that industry. So, I mean, it's, it's really gotten out of hand. A lot of cartels. Yeah. Well, what, what about the question we have on YouTube? I think it's rather interesting. You want to read it, Xavier? Yeah, there's a question on YouTube. If low orbit satellites work as advertised, does that change how attractive cities remain? And I think what they're referencing is like Starlink and the ability for even rural areas to have super fast internet now. I think, it I, I think it's already cold. happening. I, yeah. 
I have DSL and I'm on video with you right now. It's fast yeah. enough. And I am, Jack can attest, I am in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Really I, when I was driving my big ass truck down the road to her house, I was like, please don't let somebody come the other way because I'm not going backwards. <laughs> I mean, there's not enough room. I don't know how the hell they get past each other on that road. And I'm from the I'm from the hills, man. Um, yeah. I do think fast internet to rural areas, whether it's, you know, we'll probably trip the YouTube filter now, 5G, or whether it's <laughs> it's low orbit satellite or it's just broadband initiatives definitely pulls away from when we add that a lot of the upper mobile income level people today can work remotely and then COVID comes along and gives everybody a test drive and all employers go like, gee, when I send people home to work, they actually work. They don't just slide. I, I still, okay, well then I can let them do that. And I think that's, that's part of the exodus. Like you can blame all the crime and demonstrations and all on why people are leaving New York city or Los Angeles or whatever. But in the end, I think the bigger macro reason is it's really expensive to live there. And now I have an opportunity to live better for less money somewhere else and keep my income. And I think that's the calculus that more people are doing than, you know, there's riots. I don't think the riots or homeless people shitting in the street or any of that stuff helps for sure. It makes them want to leave. But there's a lot of these cities that don't necessarily have as bad of problems. And they're still seeing this flow out because it's very expensive to live in these cities and it's even very expensive to live in because we say suburbs, but boy, that's a, that's a whole onion of its own, right? That, that beltway of suburbs that exist around a city, right? That really close in, but still not in the city. That's where the most expensive housing is, except oddly with all the zoning, usually in a city, they'll either be the East side, the South side or the West side. That's cheap and no one wants to live there where they've zoned out and put all the lower income people because you can't push them too far out because you got to have all the people to provide all those services that you want in your cities and they're all low income, right? You got to have janitors and you got, you know, things like that. Um, and then once you go further out, st property starts to drop in value and okay, I can live better because I'm willing to deal with like when I used to work at an office, I would deal with a one hour commute just to have a better place to live for my family and for the money I could afford. But gee, as soon as I don't have to do that, you know, it's, I'll go as far out as I, as, as I'm comfortable with for my general, general life. And boy, the traffic stuff that CJ hit on, that's huge because I remember after I started, you know, not having a job anymore and, and went several months to several years without really being in big city traffic and then making the mistake of acting like a normal person going somewhere on a Saturday and going, or I mean, uh, <laughs> during the week, right? Like, what the hell have I done? Like, this is awful. Like, I didn't, I, I, I don't think you even realize how bad that traffic situation is until you come out of it for a while. It's, it's insane. I just yeah, and then when you go back into just a little hint of it, you're like, oh, I can't do this again. <clears throat> So um, Brad Smith, whoever asked that question on YouTube, that's a great question. Uh, Brad Smith, who's the former president of Microsoft, has this book called Tools and Weapons, where he talks about how Microsoft is actually trying to like expand broadband access into more rural communities in America. And they're going to do it for free based on the idea that they can sell uh, like secondary services and products on top of that broadband layer. But my point is that it's the market that's fixing this problem, right? It's not, it's not the, the political class that's fixing it. The market is naturally coming up with solutions to this and making rural areas more accessible to people who are oppressed in these big cities. And it's not just goods and services. I just realized it's education and an opportunity that gives people the reason to move to cities and why they did in the first place. And now with the internet, Done. You can do whatever you want from wherever you want. You have access to all of the education in the world and you have the, uh, the market. So you can sell anything you want that you can manufacture, make or produce. So y you don't need to go to the cities. Anymore. Especially if you make a living digitally. Exactly. CJ, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'd, coming from a historical perspective, X hits on it really hard. They're like, when you if you go back to the you know the middle ages and, and what have you when a person wanted an education like the universities were all in the cities like you traveled as a young person to one of these great educational facilities and i maybe we've 
lost touch with the reality. We're still doing that. I mean, if you think of the universities that people, you know, the really desirable universities people want to attend, most of them are either in big cities or they're the small town, but it's like we were saying earlier, there's a big difference in a town of 50,000 that's the biggest town within an hour and a half and a town of 50,000 that's 25 minutes away from a, from a city of 2 million. Like, really, people have traditionally gone to the city for an education. Yeah, and it made sense in an era where, you know, books were relatively scarce and where you had to have physical access to everything. Um, and so, you know, you could sell a, going to Oxford or whatever simply on like, it's got the biggest library in, in the time zone, you know. Um, and that gradually becomes less of a thing over time. And obviously with the internet and everything being digital, it mostly becomes, you know, pointless. I mean, not only can you access so much stuff digitally for free, but, you know, if you add in um, ordering books off Amazon or wherever and everything else, it's like you, you pretty much can access anything you want. I mean, I've got like, I'm basically a book hoarder. I've, I've got more piles of books and whatever. Like I, I probably should, should seek medication at this point for, for my book uh, <laughs> problem. And, you know, I, I don't live close to a big city. I don't, I can't remember the last time I actually bought a book from a brick and mortar bookstore and I have a bunch of digital books too, but I, I still like the, like the real stuff. And, and then sometimes, you know, you can only find some really old obscure book. You can only find a, a hard copy, but yeah, I, I think it definitely, it changes everything. And, um, shoot, I thought I had a, I had another point on this, but I lost my, my train of thought. It happens. It happens. It's the goose factor. Really. I've, I've already, yeah, earlier today, I already taught goosed. multiple history classes over Zoom. So, yeah, yeah you love oh, that, yeah. don't you? Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's <laughs> totally way better than actually talking to people in person. Do you have to wear a mask when you're teaching on Zoom? <laughs> oh, God. That's a thing. No. I'm sure thanks. some idiot somewhere is probably doing that, but yeah. Dude, dude, there was, I, I was reading about this business meeting they were holding over Zoom and they were all required to wear masks and someone took their mask off and somebody got up and left the meeting. Oh my God. You're fine. They should leave. I'm, I'm fine with that person leaving. That's okay with me. That's that's <laughs> no, they need. Vote. They just they need get, to be put down. They get to vote on our paycheck. <laughs> well, I'm interested in the answer to a different YouTube question, which is um, what's the biggest city you've lived in. We'll go around quickly. Don't explain. Start with Jack. Uh, probably the Dallas Fort Worth area with 6 million people. Yeah. John. I've always lived in Austin, Texas, my entire life. CJ. I grew up in the Miami Fort Lauderdale metropolitan area. So okay. quite big. Peter. Grew up in New York City, the Bronx, until I was 18 years old. Then I lived in the South Florida area <laughs> with <laughs> CJ was just talking about. And now I live in the Atlanta area. Val. <laughs> Been about 10 minutes from New York City my whole life. Xavier. The 700 mile long city of Florida. <laughs> I, I lived in the DC area. Thriller Park. That, I think that was the biggest one I was in. Houston is smaller than DC, I, I believe. I lived in Santa Cruz though. Santa Cruz was actually quite good. It was one of those like small, yeah, one of those smaller yeah. cities. And, and, and it was as liberal as it was, it was still like, at the time it was really cool. Now it's a shithole again. Well, so why do we think people are getting so butthurt about us saying you should get out of the city? There is a sort of like romantic factor to it, right? Like, like there what? Is, there's something to be said about for for like you know before this coronavirus crap happened. Like every single night, I could I could do whatever I want. There's always a Bitcoin meetup or whatever you're interested in. That night, there is a group of people who are have some event going on about it. There's always a bar or a restaurant, a million things you could do. And the idea I've I've been kicking around the idea of leaving for a long time for all the reasons that we've been discussing, but. The idea of like leaving, it is sort of like, like, you, like, it's almost like you have to break up with one of those girls that's really bad for you, but like you just, she's like gorgeous and you can't leave her. It's like something similar to that like situation. Oh yeah, that. Just be honest, it's not because she was gorgeous. <laughs> I, I think it's because a lot of people want to leave and they, they, they've talked themselves into a situation where they believe that they can't because it requires change, it requires sacrifice. And I think when you tell somebody they should get out of the city and they don't agree with you, really, they really don't agree with you, they don't get upset. They're just like, whatever, then I'm going to stay here and you leave. 
But when you're making sense, I think it makes them angry. I think there's one segment that's that. And then I think there's another segment, and maybe it's a good turning point to some of the conspiratorial seeming things and stuff like that in Agenda 21. I think that a lot of people who mean well, who are concerned with environmentalism, have been sold the idea that it is more environmentally friendly for us all to live like cockroaches in a roach motel in the city. And I think they, but I think they, I know you're shaking your head. No, but I think they really believe that. And I think there is a big push that this high density makes a better effective use of resources and that the whole planet would be better if we all crowded ourselves into multi-million count cities and then just left everything else alone, except for the farmland. And, and I think there's, there's, there's a big belief in that. And now you're getting into environmentalism, which has become a religion instead of a science. And now you're attacking somebody's faith. And if you want to piss somebody off, attack their faith. And I think that's, I think it's those two camps are your primary two camps of very angry people. So let's talk about the conspiracies. I'm going to get my ice bucket. <laughs> the foil hat. I'm going to pour a second drink if we can all keep going here. All right. Yeah. So that environmentalist thing, Jack, uh, I was really lucky to get to know a fellow named John Charles in Oregon who came to the Liberty Movement from the socialist perspective first, rabid environmentalist, did a bunch of research and discovered to his dismay mm -hmm. that all these big cities are giant bombs of environmental crap. And if you let people disperse more, their shit disperses more and it makes less of an impact. Yep. And as yes. countries become more prosperous through allowing them to go through their fossil fuel phase, right? They start caring more about the environment and take care of it. Mm -hmm. And he became a libertarian and started fighting smart growth really aggressively. So yeah, I mean, permaculture some, some agenda 21 here. Well, yeah, permaculture's founder, Bill Mollison, once quipped, nothing is so unsustainable as a city. Uh, and that its number one export was garbage. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just shows that those that claim that they're for environmentalism are in large part for control, because as we all know, the cities are, aren't good for the environment, people living more off the land and spreading out. And so we've been alluding to Agenda 21. For those not familiar, Agenda 21 is a United Nations program that originated in 1992 at the Rio de, Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit. George Herbert Walker Bush was the president at the time. He signed on to it. And essentially what it is, is a series of recommendations and controls and theories. This is where we get the term sustainable development, or at least where that term was popularized whereby cities, states, and national governments uh, implement these top-down controls, smart growth is one of them, in order to benefit the environment. And they have three E's, which are equity, environment, and I forget the third one, social justice, oh, and economy, economy, equity, and environment. And they wanna bring about equality for all of these things. But in reality, that's not what's taking place at all. And when Jack was talking about the trains earlier, this whole smart growth idea, uh, it really perverts uh, markets. And we have the same phenomenon in Austin. They have this red line that no one hardly ever rides. And it goes from downtown up to like Northeast of the city. And it's not based on market demand on where people want to go or where there's new employment and stuff. It's based on desired growth zones. And so we see problems and all throughout this episode, we've been talking about how cities are too centralized, even a city of 500,000 or a million. Well, it's being centralized to the point where now the United Nations is having a say in how local governments throughout the world are going to develop. Early on, they called it local agenda 21 in Santa Cruz, for example. Uh, but this gentleman blew the lid on that and started exposing it when they tried to shut him down from having genuine biodiversity on his property. And they wanted him to like get rid of some of the plants he was planting. And uh, I gave a speech to the Austin City Council where I pointed out that their comprehensive planning process is nothing more than local agenda 21. And I uncovered this document that was like in 2005 where they said, every time we call it local agenda 21, it brings out the people on the right and the patriots and the conspiracy theorists. So moving forward, we recommend that local governments simply call it comprehensive planning. 
But this is where you see the push to have people in compact cities, mixed use development. There's a large effort to minimize the use of automobiles. That's why they're setting up bike lanes and they're doing the back end parking. And then there's this companion document called the Global Biodiversity Assessment, which is like hundreds of pages about how to implement Agenda 21. And in that document, this is where the population reduction thing comes in. They say that if we are to maintain the current levels of population, then everyone would have to live as serfs. If we're to maintain the current standard of living, then we would need to dramatically reduce the population to somewhere around like 1.5 billion, something like that. So that's what Jack was talking about earlier when it's like, we really got to change our way of life if we're going to, if we're going to maintain this population, we didn't say that specifically, but that's what it's all about. And so you see people coming in and they're wanting to like section off highways and close down exit ramps and make it difficult for the rural towns. So we're going to see tension because that's the plan from on high, but people are leaving the cities left and right. So it's going to be interesting how it all pans out. How do you pull them back once they go? And one of the reasons I've been telling people to leave, and I think part of the reason I'm getting so much pushback and angry, pissed off veterans who say they're going to stand and fight. And then you talk to them and you find out, well, they don't even live in the damn cities you're telling people to get out of. They live like 2000 miles away and telling somebody else to stay there while they get their business burned down. Um, but it's not just the rioting that I'm concerned with. It's, it's this type of planning. And my view is that the plan right now is for those, those beltway suburbs and as far out as they can go, is to pull them into the city and take their economy away from, from them. And I don't know that there's any stopping that right now. And what it's going to do is it's going to shit can the value of that property, which makes it harder to sell, which makes it harder to leave. But that doesn't mean they're going to cut the property taxes. And what they want to do is they want to shut down the ability to build any new single family housing around these cities so that any new development will be multi-tenant housing they want to put in, you know, basically project housing to make it fair. And I think that it's kind of been slowed down at the federal level. And I, I'm not a huge fan of Trump, but I will give a person credit for what they've done, whether I like them or not. And th that plan was well underway under Obama. And Trump has sh you know, stopped that. The motivations aren't exactly clear as to why, but it has shut down. But it, you don't need the federal government to do it. And what John's talking about is exactly what's going on. They'll do it with the Fed if they have to. But these cities have enough power to do it locally. And the real plan is local, right? If you can get both sides working together, fine. And what I see happening is now that people are starting to exodus, your productive people are leaving. What's left behind is the parasite class. And you also have kind of this, this group of people that feel guilt for their, their success, their self-loathing, self-deprivating people, they'll vote for this crap because they think they're helping. And what you're going to end up with is these cities growing like a swelling amoeba to encompass everything around them. And to me, that is like, get out, please get out. Because I don't think, you know, this is what we were talking about way back to episode one with Vin of like some of these shifts that are coming, these great changes you're not going to stop this. You have to figure out how to deal with it. Like it's like trying to stop a, a grist mill stone or something. You're going to get ground underneath it. You got to get out of the mill. Yeah. And I also don't see enough people aware of what this is to actually have any sort of resistance or counter, uh, counter options, right? The, the, there aren't enough people as sophisticatedly educated on these topics. There's not enough of us, let's say to actually do something about it in that regard, because everybody's got their little topic that they're that they're keen on, but to, to look back with a 40,000 pers foot perspective and say, this is the big wave that's coming. How do we surf that? It's like, how do you get out of the way of a tsunami, right? We're sitting here saying, oh, we, you know, we can dodge the system. We can find the gray areas where we can work and get out of the state's way. But the job of the state is to take over everything. Did this happen before though, CJ, right? Like, isn't this all just the same thing all over again in a new way with new paint? If you think back to like the 1600s in the countryside of England, like didn't the industrialists as they started to advance forward and move toward an industrial society say, Hey, how do we get a peasant who, who just, you know, sits around and, and, and has everything he needs working three or four hours a day 
to move into these industrial centers. And then didn't we just do the same thing again with the industrial revolution in the United States? And that's why we had the education system brought in from Prussia that we talked about in the last episode. Cause how do you get the farm kid who has everything he needs to move to the, you know, the mill town or whatever. I mean, isn't this just right. the same thing all over again, but now worse. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's often, you know, deliberate policies to, to do that, to provide that, you know, proletariat, so to speak, by, by re- removing their, their options to not be part of the urban proletariat. But, um, you know, when I look at something like, like agenda 21 and all that sort of stuff, and, and I admit, I'm not like a super expert on that, but w- one thing that I always think of is as, as a, as a parallel are Indian reservations. And I think that people who want to rule, sometimes they consciously know this, and sometimes I think they just sort of instinctively, tacitly kind of hit on it, that the best way to control a large group of people is to make them dependent. Because if you're dependent, then you're not going to push back, you're not going to rebel, right? This is why it was the feisty independent farmers who began, you know, the American Revolution in, in colonial Massachusetts. It's these feisty independent people. Um, who who were not dependent for their living on anyone else. And so, you know, you look at the strategy of Indian reservations, right, was confine these people to a terrible piece of land, remove, you know, exterminate the bison and other game in the area so they have no capability to leave the reservation and be self-sufficient, and then make them dependent on Uncle Sam bringing in crappy military rations every few months or whatever, uh, otherwise, you starve to death. Well, if that's the situation you're in, you're not going to be a, you're going to be a nice docile Indian. You're not going to go on the war path because you're literally going to starve if you don't get those GI rations next week for be, for being under good behavior. And I think that that's basically um, the the kind of principle that's at play. It's the same sort of idea. Why do they want to herd so many people into dense cities? Because well, if you're in a dense city, you're much more dependent in countless ways for being able to take care of your basic needs. We're seeing that a lot, you know, these days, that, that people in dense cities have a much harder time when anything goes wrong a little bit of taking care of their basic needs. And they certainly can't do it without the state if they're in the middle of a giant, you know, urban metropolis. So, um, you know, in, in terms of- Would you liken so, it to a farm? Yeah, like, oh yeah, in a lot of ways, sure, sure. yeah, farm. same idea. Same yeah, idea. Like Federal Reserve. Yeah. Yep, and you and and you for get sure. rid of the cows that are giving you a problem, right? You yep. you butcher them first, and you want to breed docile cows mm-hmm. who are going to agree to whatever you fences you put up. Yeah, and you you use you know goodies. It's not it's not just the prod, right? You use goodies too, like you know you feed Free them and you take care. care of them, even provide them with healthcare. Yeah, but how about you know, UBI? It's, yeah, uh, it's it, but it's all so that you can exploit exploit them more efficiently. And control them more efficiently in the future. So, um, and I'm, I have to, to jet in a minute. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have to bail out. I have something else I have to thank do. Thank you but, for um, being here. I've loved yeah, your man. contributions. Oh, yeah. thank, thank you all very much uh, for having me. It's great. Uh, those those of you have I've met online before. Good good to see you. Good to talk to you. And those of you first time, nice to meet you all. So, CJ. Uh, virtually. Yeah. Um, I probably interacted with most of you at social on social media at one point, if nothing else. But um, I just want to throw out one more thing for for anybody who's listening. Um, uh, a cool book that I know of, and probably uh, the, the rest of you all have at least heard of it. Maybe some of you have read it. Is Jane Jacobs, "The Death and Life of Great American Cities." This is a, a really interesting book from I think fifty or sixty years ago, and it's been a long time since I read it. And I probably, I'm sure, don't agree with everything in it, but. Um, it was a very, very interesting look at cities and the difference between like real cohesive, organic neighborhoods and communities versus the type of stuff we've been talking about here today, as far as these centrally controlled, centrally planned uh, sorts of, you know, progressive dystopias that right. so many people find themselves in today. So, so CJ, you know, also, if you have any goods or services or a website that you'd like to plug, please do. Absolutely. DangerousHistoryPodcast.com. The Dangerous History Podcast is available wherever you like to consume your podcasts. And um, it is the, uh, if if Murray Rothbard, Lysander Spooner, George Carlin, and John Carpenter got together and had a kid, and that kid grew up to be a history nerd who started a podcast, it would be my podcast. Nice. Yes. Cool.
Thanks Take for care, CJ. Us. All right. I like Have that dependence, the dependency and independent uh, distinction that you made. That's I think that's really valuable. And it's obviously more when you're in the city, you're more dependent. When you're out in the rural area, the farmland, you're more independent. There's a lot of, of power to, to being independent. Absolutely. Thanks very much uh, for having me on. Good to talk to all of you. Take care. Take care. Thanks, CJ. Bye-bye. You know, one of the things that uh, Konkin said, and don't ask me to find the quote because I won't be able to, but he said something to the effect of, you take a little bit of logic, a little bit of revisionism, and a little bit of counter-economics, and you mix it in a pot and stir it together, and you get agorism. So CJ really has a great perspective, and I really encourage everybody to subscribe and listen to his podcast because it is so informative and educational. I have learned so much history from that show. It's one of the best podcasts out there, in my honest opinion. And I'm not just saying that because he was our guest. No, I would agree. He's, uh, I, I was excited when I knew we could get him on. Yeah, I've had him on my show a few times and you, it, it is the, his, he's a history professor that's teaching what they won't let him teach in college on a podcast. That that's, that's the best way I can describe it. Um, back on our subject, he was talking about the rise and fall of great American cities. And I had a, a, a picture come into my mind when he said that of Chicago back in early two thousands, uh, I was in, Chicago for business reasons. And I had to go to the airport and just out of curiosity, I took the train to the airport, started to question my sanity and my safety on the way. But then we ended up going through a part of Chicago that I don't know if you'd even see it if you weren't on a train and it was awful, but it wasn't awful because it was like gangs and stuff like that. It was almost to the horizon in all directions, rusted out, destroyed, dilapidated look like third world war zone industrial and i didn't see a human not a single person on the streets and it was almost like being in some sort of dystopian movie and you look at how much is there and how much resource and there's that many people in chicago and this is all just sitting there and i i, I just wonder you know they use the term rust belt and I think people get offended by that. Well, maybe you've never seen something like that. Like how much of that exists in these giant cities that are still supposedly successful cities. And there's these massive swaths of absolutely nothing in them. And you know, if you want to fix a city, can anything be done with that? Detroit. Detroit. Detroit same way. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, there's a lot that could be done. It would just take some vision and it would have, it would take some commitment on people's parts, right. To, to, build gardens i rip up concrete you know repurpose buildings and make sure and then but then you have the problems of how can you zone them can you zone them for living in if they're if they're dilapidated you know yeah condemned yeah if they're condemned it makes it hard but it, there are a bunch of awesome ways to to refurbish them i mean even malls that are falling apart now you can turn them into living mixed living situations there could be some more. opportunity for like crypto millionaires to go in and buy up yeah. a couple city blocks and invite some people to stay there, but you're going to a total shithole. So you get what you pay for oftentimes. But I mean, oh, I think if you tore it all down, I mean, another way to look at it, I, I was having breakfast one day with Toby Hemingway before he passed away. And I had just seen this documentary that morning in my hotel. And it was, I think it was Detroit. And there were these like four or five story concrete buildings and it was about trees, how trees come back. And there were like trees growing on the roof and they had like crumbled through the concrete and the roots had gone down to the earth. Nice. And it was like, it was like, it looked like some kind of eerie temple or whatever, but this building had only been abandoned like 25 years ago. And I told him about it and he got this twinkle in his eye and he goes, see, it won't take long. <laughs> and, and, and I wonder if some of these cities, I mean, instead of us fixing them, a lot of them are in very exceptional climates, right? Because they're near bodies of water. They're near resources. Like, will nature just reclaim some of these? And in, in, in a thousand years from now, if there's no record of it, would you not even know that it was there? And how many times has that happened before? Yeah. 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 How many civilizations have we gone through? There's this wild, part of Agenda 21 is called the Wildlands Project. And there's people that have done simulations on if it were to be achieved, what it would look like. And it's this map. And one of the things that they want to do is create wildlife corridors. 
So essentially right now, what we in large part have is like a lot of the, almost all of the land is fenced off, right? There's a lot of open area, but a lot of land is owned by people or the government and it's fenced off and the wildlife can't go through. Maybe deers can jump fences, so on and so forth. What Agenda 21 wants to achieve is reversing that role whereby the humans are in the compact cities that are representative of these small black dots on this wildlands project map. And then there's these huge corridors where the wildlife is able to travel freely and return to more of a natural state. So maybe the cities that don't make the cut, uh, they will genuinely return back to that dilapidated state if this Agenda 21, it's also called Agenda 2030 now, is able to come to fruition. But well, we're, we're not supposed to go Nicole. there, are we? John, Nicole. on that, we're not allowed to go there once they do this, right? Like, No, it'll be sectioned off. No exclusionary human. zone. Yeah. You're not to go there. Nicole's can't, on can't, mute. Can't Nicole's hear you, Nicole. Oh, that's what's going on. Okay, so go. um, we're the Goose Podcast, and we're talking about permission to live in dilapidated buildings. I'm not sure why we're looking for it exactly. I just I want to hand it to Peter because he's been pretty quiet, and I can see the cogs working in his head. Peter, what do you got? Uh, do you want to get what's conspiratorial? Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, you are the free man what, beyond the wall. What do we wall. do? This you are the free man beyond the wall. And we're talking no about the what do we do with these cities? Hour. It's tough for me because I really do enjoy going to the city. I mean, I love going to New York. I mean, Sal knows whenever I go to New York, he's the first person I contact. I'm like, come in, let's go to Chinatown, which I assume we can't do anymore. Nope. But it's I've also come to the realization, you know, I was up in the mountains last week and you know no cell phone service the wi-fi was horrible but it was so relaxing and it was so safe i felt so just away from everything and i think it's gotten to the point where i was looking at some prices up there of land and stuff and it's still cheap and i think it's just if for nothing else just an emergency or even a um an investment because I think that out of the way, I've already seen prices in Georgia outside of the city. I mean, I'm talking about up towards the mountain area, up towards Blue Ridge. Prices are starting to go up. I think people are wanting to get out of the city. Uh, I talked to people in New York. Uh, Gene Epstein lives on the Lower East Side. He says that like it almost seems like half of the Lower East Side is gone. They've just up and left. So I don't know what's keeping people in cities. I mean... I still have a, a day job that I like and it's inside the city, just inside Atlanta. I don't have to go too far, but um, yeah, I think it's just gotten to the point where I think that when you think about some of those futuristic dystopian science fiction shows, movies where the city just is, you know, judge dread kind of stuff. I mean, that to me, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, but I, I, in the next hundred years, I mean, cities could be like that, especially if we keep going the way we're going. If we don't have any kind of evolution, if, if we don't have any kind of awakening, awaken at, well, yeah. And, you know, an intellectual awakening too. Uh, people to become curious again, to ask questions again. And to, you know, the last six months has just convinced me, that you're there, there's no way we can rely on probably 98 to 99 percent of the population for anything i mean they are just mindless automatons scared for their lives and you know we had the cdc last week say 94 percent of the people who've died from this had like 2.6 on average comorbidities and Dude, it's like that and, was a conspiracy and theory yeah. And I'm like, well, it's on the CDC website and yeah. they were taking it down. People were sharing this on Twitter and they were taking it down. They, they took I down mean, JP's video about that today. Did you see that? JP no. Spears? JP Spears yeah. put out a comedy video on that and it, it came down at about oh, three yeah. o'clock today. Okay. That's I mean, the we're scary thing, right? Because it is literally like corralling the thought processes of billions of people into a very narrow set of options. And anybody who thinks outside those options gets labeled, but there are more people now who are thinking outside those options than there are people labeling them. What happens now? 
Yeah. Tom Woods calls it the three by five index card of acceptable thought. And if you yeah. say something that's not on that, then they you're get... not allowed to have it. Nope. I tried okay. to talk to the bank people today and, and like, did you hear about the fact that the CDC said this? And they looked at me like with glazed over eyes, like they were like, they, how do I believe this? Or, you know, you're crazy. And we're I'm actually like, afraid that you said it. Like it's yes. dangerous that you're you said threat. it and they might be seen with you while you're saying it. And <laughs> exactly. Find out. They were uncomfortable. Does, doesn't that feel like Stalin's Russia? Dude, seriously. Like, I'm not worried about what I said. I'm worried about being seen hearing what you said. Yeah. And then you take that with all this urban planning and it starts to get very dark. And it what, what, what next comes into my mind is like these buildings they're building in Asia with like 40, 50,000 people living in one building and they're trying to design the building. So literally you can be born in the building and die in the building. Wow. And, and maybe you take a field trip to see a duck or something like that, but you never <laughs> leave no. the building. Like you stay in the building forever. The building wow. is its own self-contained city with Ecosystem. its own little parks and gardens and shit. And it's like, if I wanted to do that, I'd go live in freaking outer space and head to Mars or some shit like that. Like, and this is like, people think you're nuts when you say that, but like, I'm telling you, they're going to build that. That will be one of the next things they do is they'll build one of those in New York or they'll build it in Chicago or Atlanta or whatever. And, and people will will fight to be one of the people to get into it. People, me... people have no hope for the future. Um, the average serf who was literally a slave had more freedom than most people in this society in that they Absolutely. could is they can make their own hours. Um, they could wear what they wanted. You know, th there was there was no bell system. They weren't on this factory bell system of going to work at a certain time and then waiting for the, the, the you know, metaphorical bell to go to lunch and do this. I mean, the reason people have, in my opinion, have embraced this pandemic is because it gives them something to live for. They feel like they're part of the greatest generation. So it, you know, they're it's fighting a good. war. Yeah, they're, they're, they're helping you know, their it's, neighbors. It's, Do people it's, actually it's, feel it's, like that? It, it, yeah. They feel like it's their own personal march on Selma. Let me is, know. That's I'm what this is. I disagree with what, what you just said, Pete, about the search being more free before. And Murray Rothbard has this great essay, Left, Right, and Prospects for Liberty. And he actually says the exact opposite thing where he says that when you think about how things were in the feudalism and the serfdom, and then you compare it to how things were today. And I always point out, like, if, if the serf, sure, the serf had relative freedom in certain areas, but if the serf says F you to the king and down with the crown, they'll cut his head off and put it up on a big stake. And so- Right with a cop. Grateful, grateful yeah. that we have this society <laughs> here where at least we have relative freedom. We got this agorist podcast going on. We're not getting shut off. Maybe we shut off a of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> but in regards to the city, for more hope for people, we do have this phenomenon where seasteading is being innovated. We have uh, free cities, which are like corporate private cities. There's some work going down in Honduras. This guy, Michael Strong, is doing a lot of that work. And there's a lot of innovation taking place in non-territorial government. And there's a huge trend towards intentional communities and eco villages. And so while the 98% may be non-playable characters and they're just going along to get along, um, you know, bear in mind, it was only 2% of the people that fought the American revolution and had that big drastic change in the history of this country. So I think if enough of us, rather than messing around on Facebook and putting out a bunch of podcasts all week, started building and cooperating together and networking together and put, throwing some money down and maybe bit, getting some land and creating our own little mini city states, hopefully we can grow the conscious agora and show people that there's another way to do things. And when people see us with the nice tan and we're eating healthy and we're having a great time and we're like raising our kids in a tribal way, maybe more people will say, hey, I need to get the heck out of the city and go try what some of those guys are doing. Or Gotta get going, tribe, guys. But, Take care, y'all. Yeah. My Peace, piece. Um, or build your tribe in the city, right? You know, I, I hear people not wanting to break regulations to live in a commercial building in blown out St. Louis, which is blown out. Well, the only thing you're dependent on the government for in that situation is hoping the police don't kick you out and they can turn off your water and electricity. If you figured the water and electricity out, you can live where you can live there. You're just not legally there. Does it matter if you're legally somewhere or not? If you have a big enough squad, I guess it doesn't matter. 
I think like um, the thing is, I think a lot of if, if the host dies and the parasite goes away too, and eventually, Absolutely. eventually they're going as people leave in droves and exiles. There was an article in the one of these papers up here just this week that like the U-Haul companies are overwhelmed with people leaving. Yeah, and as that like okay. continues, uh, you're going to start to see like the parasitical class start to dry up. And I think that's a lot. Like that's what this rezoning has, has is all about because people are leaving, so they're trying to attract them in with, oh, now we're going to gentrify the area. Yeah, there used to be projects here, but now we're going to do. We need another excuse to get people in, so we're going to put up bars and whole nightlife scene. So that's the first thing. The other thing, the other point too here is that I think I'm confident it's going to get better, right? Using tools like, uh, you know, every all the different tools we talk about in our shows, from crypto anarchism to cryptocurrency and stuff like that that will enable people to sort of become more free 3d printing and permaculture, things like that is going to start to help people. And it's going to enable that process, that transition into the more rural areas. I don't think cities are ever going to die, right? There's always going to be a need for people are always going to conglomerate around areas of commerce, but I think eventually the state will wither away and the cities will become less oppressive. I like yeah, that cities optimism. aren't bad per se. It's the, it's the politicians it's the in the artificial them. city or the artificial community that's imposed on people. Look at what Lori Lightfoot. The natural city growth. Right, right. Look at what Lori Lightfoot has done to Chicago or what Bill de Blasio has done to New York City. And it's, by the way, it's not even just cities, right? Um, take the whole state of New York or the whole state of New Jersey or Puerto Rico or Massachusetts or California. These places are on the verge of collapse. And that's, we're not too far away. We're not too far off in my opinion from that day. And as that happens, what's gonna, I think that's going to, put pressure on the national and the federal government to sort of bail them out. Eventually the federal government won't be able to bail out these progressives and you're going to have a serious major collapse on your hands. And I think that's sort of with the direction in which we're headed. Okay. So we're, we're near ending time. I think we'll wrap up on this. Um, what I'd like to do is just go around the horn, any final thought, keep it, keep it short. And then tell us how to find you in other places besides unloose the goose. We'll start with Xavier. Uh, final thought is I will never drink tequila again on the show because I am so angry. <laughs> um, usually I become very happy after I drink tequila, but some Freedom. of the things just got me. Um, you can find me at Fireon Global Partners, P-H-I-R-E-O-N, globalpartners.com or just fireon.com. Okay, John, what do you got? Um... I am looking forward to coming up with some funds and getting a nice 10 to 20 acres far away from Austin, Texas, where I was born and raised. And as Sal was saying, we had one mayor that dramatically shifted the city and accelerated its demise. All it took was one mayor with two terms. And literally, there's people defecating all of the streets. The prices and the taxes are skyrocketing. They want to increase property tax during all the COVID stuff when everyone's struggling to pay rent. But uh, looking forward to getting a nice big plot of land. And if people want to check out my podcast, it's called the Live Free Now Show. You can go to livefreenow.show. And if people want to know what all this crazy Kratom stuff everybody's drinking is all about, you can get a free ounce at freeounceofkratom.com. Nice. All right, Sal. So I guess the final point that I would make is all, of all the terrible things we've said about cities, it's all true. The one point I would make is that there's a lot of opportunity for counter economics in the city. Uh, much more so than rural areas. If you're in Agoras, you're in, a lot of times people say, how can I get started in counter-economics? If you live in a city, there is no shortage of available options uh, to you. And customers. Um, yeah, exactly, L really. Um, other than that, I think, you know, obviously you can find me, saliagoras.com. I'm on Twitter at Sally Mayweather. And I sell th uh, 3D printers at 3 dprintergobrr B -R 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 com. Jack? Uh, I'm going to just restate what I've been saying for years and a lot lately get out get out get out get out um i i think that all of this is going to accelerate and i just want to be clear when i say get out i'm talking about what i've been calling flashpoint cities there are some well-run and well-ordered cities still and if you've been well-run and well-ordered and not locked in your house in the last year this this year here and you haven't had complete compl misery and your city hasn't burned guess what? You live in a pretty stable city and it, it might be one of the ones worth staying uh, near. But in general, I just think if you really want to do a lot of the things that we talk about, getting out of the cities or having a way to get out when necessary is, 
is probably of paramount importance to your future and liberty. As far as finding me and what I do, I'm at the survival podcast.com. Or if you don't want to type all that crap out, tspc.co. Uh, and you can check out my podcast. We've been running 12 years and uh, it's probably worth checking out. A lot of people seem to like it. Give us a shot. If you haven't yet, maybe you will too. Okay. I'll, I'll wrap up. We get, into agenda 21 we talk about land use planning and a lot of people think it's a great idea they think that stopping the city from growing into the country preserves farmland and what it really does is it exacerbates the disparity between the rich and the poor it makes a bigger poor class because a poor class can be controlled and we don't want to talk about it i think whoever brought up that point today is absolutely right if you're in a city and you're building the life you want to live in the city, more power to you. I have lived in some cities and I've loved it when I had money because it took money to be happy in the city. And what I realized over time is I work hard for money and it goes further in the country for me. And it gives me more stability, more freedom, and more of the kind of life I want to live where I can have a cocktail at four in the afternoon with a bunch of smart dudes on a podcast called Unloose the Goose. So really, if you are in the city and you're like, but you're wrong, look at your city, look at the policies and look what they're doing to you. In the cities that are melting down now, if you're not in it, that's probably already happening in your city. I'm watching it start to happen in Nashville. It's just behind the curve. It's not that it's immune to it. And that's because they do come in at the local level first and work their way up. And there is no counter push at the local level. So I hope you've enjoyed tonight's episode. Do head over to unloosethegoose.com and sign up for our email list. The sign up is there in the upper right-hand corner. Follow us on MeWe and Facebook and Twitter and follow this channel as well. I'm pretty sure we need to set up a parlor account, Jack. That seems to be- we follow my parlor. I, I speak for all of us on parlor until y'all get your lazy asses <laughs> over there. Yeah. We should also yeah. do a text service so that when we get shut down by the, uh, the the wonderful social media conglomerates that we'll still be able to contact people directly. We have it. It's called Telegram. I do want to thank all the people who've been supporting us. We've had some people talking on MeWe about putting together show notes to start getting some of these links we talk about putting in and then don't put in our show notes oh. into the show notes. We're really busy and we don't know yeah. exactly what we're going to talk about on the podcast. And then we're like, yes, we got it out. And then we run and start doing other things. So if you send me a list of what you think should be the links from a show, I will totally add it to the posts. And if you're thinking you want to, you know, help spearhead something like the parlor group or anything else, let us know. You can just go to unloosethegoose.com, click on contact. I get those emails. Jack gets those emails. Anybody else who's on here who doesn't get those emails can. We've just been not littering your inbox. Guys, with that, have a great evening. Honk. Honk, honk. honk.